First Lasha will be um, talking about Shakespeare and the Indian Indy. That's correct. Um, I love kind of Bollywood and, you know, have very populist tastes. <laughs> I love Omkara with all its songs. Um, but one of the other things, the one I was arguing for in our initial kind of argument was the indie industry in uh, Indian cinema, which I am very, very excited about. So my paper is going to be about Shakespeare in Indian indie cinema, and uh, there are other examples of indie cinema in Shakespeare, but I'm going to concentrate on uh, 10 ml Love. I'm going to use it as a case study. And 10 ml Love is an adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, so here <laughs> we go. So I'm going to begin with a little kind of scenario story. So just over 400 years ago, there lived a playwright named William Shakespeare. And he wanted to write a play in which the majority of the plot would unfold in the nighttime and in a forest. He would call it a Midsummer Night's Dream. However, there were only a couple of technical problems. The venue at which the play would be performed was open air. The lighting was largely inflexible and the play had to be performed during the day. <laughs> Conditions which were perhaps not ideal for the project he had in mind. Or so you might think. Because sample this dialogue on the slide. This is between the fairy king Oberon in the play and his helper Puck in Act 3, Scene 2 of Midsummer Night's Dream. And what I have done is marked all the words and phrases um, that indicate the time of the day and quality of light in red. And as you can see, there are many. So, you know, Aurora's harbinger shines um, and also the entire last paragraph is all about the time of the day. So Shakespeare found a way around the challenges that his production circumstances uh, forced upon him and he thought he'd use words to describe the lighting condition. Centuries later, a screenwriter, Sharat Kataria, wanted to adapt A Midsummer Night's Dream for the Indian screen. He would call it 10 ml love. You can see a poster for it. However, he too had a big trial on his hands as he was an independent director and his budget for 10 ml love was extremely small. The way in which he negotiated the challenges is a fascinating story which merits consideration by scholars of both Shakespeare and Indian cinema. And this is the story that my paper will discuss and investigate. My criterion for claiming that 10 ml love is an independent or an indie film is simple. It is acknowledged as such by its director Kataria, who asserts that 10 ml love, and I quote him, is a true indie film as it is independent of the star system independent of the usual grammar of normalized feature film writing and all other cliche elements of a regular comic entertainer. There is also no big producer backing it, he says. Rachel Doyer, one of a hand handful of scholars to give Indian indie cinema any attention, admitted in 2011, and I quote her, there is little scholarly research on these films as yet, end quote. And this continues to be the case today even though the Indian Indy is at least 18 years old. Director Kaisad Gustad says that 1998 was a watershed year for the Indian Indy. His indie film Bombay Boys and Nagesh Kukunur's movie Hyderabad Blues were released in this year. Both the movies feature young, middle-class, transnational, urban protagonists are shot in real city locations, employ the language of the Indian cosmopolitan youth, English, it's a mixture <laughs> of Hindi and English, mixed further with vernacular languages, Telugu in Hyderabad Blues and Marathi in the Bombay Boys and are made on a very small budget. So these are very common features of the Indian Indy. 
It was clear that a new type of cinema had emerged, one very independent of Bollywood cinema. Kataria's movie can easily be seen as belonging to this type of cinema. He uses English in the film and sets the first half of the movie in streets and houses of cosmopolitan Mumbai and the next half in a forest farmhouse such as those owned by the urban elite in India. Such everyday locations too put a strain on Kataria's budget and he describes how one of his biggest challenges was shooting the nighttime forest scenes even though he had anticipated this. Kataria had reserved a sizable portion of his budget for this shoot. He did not mind cheap locations, he said, for the entire film because he wanted to save money for that part. Luckily, his production designer found a good eucalyptus farm, which looked great. On reaching the venue, however, he discovered, to his dismay, that lighting this place would take seven days if they wanted good lighting. He explains that, I quote him, it takes huge budgets to light places like this, otherwise it will just be a patch of light and looks very odd in films. So creative ways to shoot had to be found. This very seemingly individual difficulty aligns Kataria to a very specific film industry context because indie directors always mention lighting as their stumbling block. Anurag Kashyap, for instance, relates how his entire film was marred by this. His 2008 release, Gulal, was written in 2000-2001, but was made over eight years because Kashyap would shoot it around Diwali all the time, which is an Indian <laughs> festival, because they didn't have enough money for production, and Jaipur is all lit up during Diwali. It was beautiful and it gave him enough life to shoot in and that's why all the night shots that you see from beginning to the end of the film are in Diwali. <laughs> While the light was beautiful, this destroyed his film because it was, he says, set in the immediate future then, but by the time it was released, the future was past. <laughs> End quote. Owner maintains, again, another independent filmmaker, that if there is one thing he wishes he could have done differently about his film, My Brother Nikhil, it is the night sequence in the film, which he had to shoot with no lights because they didn't have the money whatsoever. And it is very dark. Um, so now when he sees it, he says that he, we could have just shot the scene during the day and it would not have affected anything. Kataria's solution was to shoot the nighttime scenes during the day, in a day-for-night format. This meant shooting in broad daylight, using filters to kill excess sunlight and boosting light on faces, with the result that nighttime forest scenes are bathed in bright blue light. Like this. So, that is what they look like. When I first saw the movie, without being aware of the production context, I associated it with the magical and enchanted quality of the forest, <laughs> where anything can happen seemed just right. Kataria's position here was not unlike that of Shakespeare, who was writing for the Globe and Blackfriars Theatre, where lighting was largely inflexible. Just as Shakespeare employed theatrical resources such as language to distinguish between day and night on his stage, Kataria found a relatively inexpensive way to make the nighttime forest scenes work for his film. However, the material reality touched every aspect of this adaptation. The production context not only affected the aesthetic quality of 10 ml love, but also seeped into the interpretation of its content as money or lack of it is at the center of 10 ml love. Whereas Midsummer Night's Dream begins with the aristocrats, Theseus and Hippolyta, 10 ml love opens with the mechanicals or the army of domestic servants employed by Mr. Rai, who is the Aegeus of this production. It is important to note the differences between the mechanicals in Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, those in Tenemel Love. To begin with, there is an alteration in the social status between the mechanicals and the domestic servants. Whereas the mechanicals in Shakespeare's play are artisans, so Quince is a carpenter, Bottom is a weaver, Flute is a bellows mender, Snout is a tinker, Snug is a joiner, and Starveling a tailor. They all have their own trades that they can ply. 
Um, the domestic servants are worse than even apprentices because they would be counted as unskilled labor. Moreover, these servants uh, in Tenemel Love are not intending to perform the tragedy of Pyramus and Thisbe at the wedding, rather they are rehearsing for the Ramlila. Ramlila, or literally Ram's play, is a dramatic representation based on the central Hindu mythology of the Ramayana. It is performed according to annual Hindu calendar around the festival of Dashera and as such is both a religious and theatrical performance. This opens a gap between Shakespeare's play and Kataria's film. In Shakespeare's play, the wedding is an employment opportunity for the mechanicals and therefore something to look forward to. In direct contrast, the wedding is an interruption for these amateur actors. So as one of them remarks, and I'll do the Hindi first and then translate it into English. So one of them remarks, Shadi ke chakkar mein to Ramlila ka banta dhar ho gaya. <laughs> this marriage affair has absolutely destroyed the Ramlila, he says. <laughs> From the first few sentences itself, therefore, it is clear that their rehearsal time is extremely limited. Ganshu Bhai, <laughs> Peter Quince of this movie, has to convince his troupe that the wedding preparations will not interfere with their rehearsal schedule. However, even while distributing roles, they are shown to be working constantly, chopping vegetables, arranging furniture. Also, uh, before they are able to carve out time for rehearsal, they are, appear in various scenes and are shown following complicated instructions for the wedding preparations. For instance, they are putting up a marquee for the wedding, then they are rudely instructed on the pattern of lights which they arrange for the wedding, and finally, Mr. Rai himself comes to check on the catering and food supplies and has to be assured that the wedding preparations are indeed complete. It is only after these chores have been completed that they find rehearsal time and space. This space is not the forest, but the backyard of Mr. Rai's house. This is where they are rehearsing. Even then, it is not a mar marvelous con convenient place for their rehearsal, as they are disturbed by the loud music that the wedding guests are dancing to. While the aristocratic wedding in Shakespeare fosters the artistic ambition of the mechanicals, which they hope will lead to praise and monetary reward, in Ten and in Love, the wedding disrupts the artistic ambitions of the servants and eats up time that could have been devoted to profitable activity. In each of the scenes with the mechanical, Kataria's film comments on the relationship between money and art. In a hilarious opening sequence, Chand, who is this uh, bottom in the um, film, implores Ganshubai to give him the role of Ravan, which is the antagonist meaty role in the Ramlila, or alternately that of Ram, who is the protagonist in this play Ramlila. Now, Shakespeare's bottom never quite manages to convince the audience that he will make a good thisbe in a monstrous little voice or will be well cast as lion, either with a roar that will do any man's heart uh, good to roar, or roar as gentle as a sucking dove. In contrast, when Chan performs snippets of Ravan or Ram, he's surprisingly good. Nevertheless, Ganshubai, so Peter Quince, decides that the role of Ravan should go to one of the other servants who is hard of hearing. He then hands out the role of Ram to another servant with a pronounced stutter. As the opening credits roll, Chand is told that he would have to play the role of monkey god Hanuman with no speaking lines. <laughs> and this is what, uh, you know, the role would look like. So that is what he'd be dressed as. He'd be the monkey god Hanuman in very few uh, speaking lines. Chand protests because he has been playing Hanuman for a number of years now and wants to try something artistically ambitious. Ganshubai, however, is immovable on the point and Chand is offered no alternative. When the servants gather at the back of the house for rehearsal, the scene ends in chaos like it does in Shakespeare's play. But to begin with, Chand, who is always eager to carve out more stage time for himself, performs the prologue. He does it brilliantly. His fellow actors are moved and there is no doubt that Chand is the best performer amongst them. Ganshubai, however, decides that Chan should not try to be too different. Rather, he wants Chan to perform exactly the way he did in the past. 
when chand objects that he has outgrown this role which seems only to consist of jumping around like an ape he says which is pretty much what the role is he is reminded that it was this very role that made him famous throughout the community it is then that one of his fellow actors chimes in that it was this jumping around that led to them receiving a donation of 501 rupees the viewers are explicitly told that this is a big amount for this troupe because one of the actors has just somewhat erroneously overheard that the henna artist at the wedding is about to receive 5000 rupees and is flabbergasted by this information he reveals this information slowly with gestures to emphasize the amount and the troupe share his incredulity at what seems to them an unbelievable sum and declare that in hindi kya dimag kharab kar raha hai or it is enough to drive one nuts <laughs> by now it is clear that these servants have little power to be inventive or to take risks while shakespeare's mechanicals give the meatiest role pyramus to their best actor bottom here ganshubai wants chand to perform exactly the same part in exactly the same manner as it might net in a donation exactly as at as it had done earlier in utter frustration chand picks a fight with ganshubai who reveals that he was not able to follow his own artistic ambitions as he had to raise chand as a single parent when chand's parents had died significantly the rehearsal is disrupted not because chan turns into an ass but because he's frustrated that the troupe would value monetary donations above artistic growth the film scenes with the mechanicals therefore deep in kataria's materialistic critique the frustrations presented here in the film are a reflection of some very real problems facing ramleela troops in india today lack of funds is leading to their gradual decline the predicament of the ramleela performers both within the film and india at large parallels that of the indian indie director trying to offer an alternative to bollywood on a minuscule budget it was the mirroring between the material circumstances of production and the material circumstances of the world within the film that produces the most potent insights into both indian indie film industry and shakespeare's play The film's obsession with talking about Indian Indies limited means translates into an incisive materialistic reading of Midsummer Night's Dream. Tenemal loves achievement in shedding new light on the play can be fully grasped by comparing it to another millennial screen version of the play which centers around class divisions, the BBC's adaptation of the play as part of its Shakespeare retold series in 2005. In this adaptation the mechanicals are low class security guards these guards decide to put on a variety entertainment show for hermia's wedding but are completely unsuited to the task for instance the performer who decides to present a magic show practices throughout the film but cannot present a single trick and bottom bumbles through the film desperately trying to be a comedian and we know that you know he can't uh, he has very unconvincing impressions and unfunny stand up routines ultimately when the guards perform at the wedding they are rescued by the benign fairies who make the magic trick work and induce laughter in the audience when bottom performs as carol thomas neely observes the mechanicals i quote her crucially catalyzed the comedy's happy ending even though their lack of talent is irredeemable in direct contrast tenemal love cuts the mechanical's final performance altogether and ends on a bitter sweet note the film opens with a talented actor chan petitioning for a role and ends with him waking up semi naked in a boat he quietly picks up his clothes as the closing credits roll on the screen While the couples in the movie get a happy ending, the Ramleela troupe never gets to perform. The film emphasizes that artistic endeavors which are not well funded have to struggle hard to survive and might die out no matter how gifted the performance might be. In showing how lack of resources can lead to failed performances, Ten ML Love provides the most sustained materialistic critique of the play to date on screens. Uncannily this was exactly the trajectory followed by Ten ML Love the film received positive reviews but was released only on 30 screens in India and that's 
very, very tiny. Tenemel Love did not lack ideas and talent, yet the process of indie filmmaking was largely responsible for its failure at the box office. One of the posts on the Facebook page dedicated to promoting the film, because social media publicity was the only affordable option. Um, so one of the Facebook uh, pages states that Rajat Kapoor, who played Oberon, helped us in keeping the film within budget by having black coffees. We saved a lot of money on sugar and milk. <laughs> that money went into hiring one more assistant for the film, he says. Well, the statement, obviously exaggerated and tongue-in-cheek, performs several functions. It draws attention to the shoestring budget on which the filmmaker was operating. It uses this for comic value and finally tries to deploy this in the service of its publicity on Facebook page. This joke is a template for understanding the film. The artistic quality of the film was not impeded by the lack of funding and Kataria could even mine the lack of funds for comedy, both within and without the film. But this film did not receive the audience it deserved. Kataria's remarks prove that he was acutely aware of his difficult position as an indie filmmaker while directing 10 ml Love and Ram Leela's troops' trials and tribulations mirrored the production reality of the film intentionally or unintentionally. And in that respect, it's uh, interesting to note, we wanted to have a screening of 10 ml Love mm. at our conference. And uh, we tried really hard yeah. to arrange for a DVD. Mm. Um, a DVD of the film was never released, by the way. Mm. Um, and we tried to arrange one, you know, which wasn't a preview copy. And uh, much as we wanted to screen it, much as they wanted us to screen it, ultimately a copy could not be arranged. So that's what we're talking about. Wow. You know, lack of funding absolutely affecting reception. As I've tried to demonstrate, indie films such as 10 ml Love, and I can talk about other indie films based on Shakespeare, not only reflect the frustrations and joys of making an Indian indie, but also, owing to their unique perspective, offer fresh insights into Shakespeare's plays. In her book on Jacobean drama on screen, Pascal Ibisher complains that there is a tendency, I quote her, in criticism of screen Shakespeare's to ignore the film's imbrication in a larger body of work and in a film industry context that determines not only what can be filmed but how it may be filmed, end quote. Um, as the case of 10 ml Love proves, where the Indian Indy is concerned, it would be negligent to ignore the industry context and the material conditions that indeed dictate not only the what and the how of the films being produced, but also influence the content of these movies. The director's concern with their own production milieu, where they have to make the best of limited resources and compete against Bollywood, allows them to interpret Shakespeare's plays materially. The Indian indie Shakespeare adaptations are thus poised to revitalize both world cinema and Shakespeare studies and merit your attention. Thank you.